Okay, there we go. And let's go ahead and get into the uh, slides. I'm going to be somewhat tied to the uh, screen, which I have been anyway because I'm trying to use the mic here on there, but also my clicker is out, so um, that's why I'm not going to be moving around too much. But let's go ahead and take a look at now stockholders equity okay now a couple comments just the course in general i mean these last three chapters 15 into 14 a little bit 15 uh 16 and 17 were sort of the you know the rite of passage chapters okay that if you've made it survived it through those uh at this point we're sort of on a uh nice little downhill trend and the material is not going to be as difficult as it was for those first uh, for those middle three chapters um, we're going to spend some time with shareholder ec shareholders equity here so if you notice we are just about to the end of the balance sheet discussion whether you realize it or not that we've been having we're kind of hovering around the income statement a little bit in chapter 12 dealing with investments and then after that we were pretty much hanging on to the balance sheet going through the liability section. Now we're down to the stockholders equity section. We'll do a little bit more with stockholders equity uh, in the next chapter, primarily focusing on earnings per share calculation. Earnings per share calculation is pretty easy when you do the uh, primary earnings per share, but we're going to start looking at dilution issues uh, in chapter 19, and so that'll be our challenge there. And then chapter 21 is going to be statement of cash flows. And we're going to have to spend time with that because that is one of the primary financial statements that we prepare. So we'll sort of jump off of the balance sheet and onto the statement of cash flows. Beauty of statement of cash flows is it is basically derived from the other two statements, the balance sheet and the income statement. We'll see how uh, we'll do that. Okay, so that's where we're going. But let's go ahead and let's take a look at our stockholders, shareholders, equity, and of course my... The clicker is out of battery. Okay. And so let's just go ahead and take a look at uh, what we mean by our uh, debt securities versus our equity. Okay. And um, we know here that we have assets minus liabilities equals shareholders, stockholders, equity. And I think you've known that for a long, long time by now, right? We could also call the difference between our assets and liabilities net assets. So stockholders' equity sort of has two names. Um, it could also be called net assets. And you come over and uh, you take a look. And you can see the stockholders' equity section of the balance sheet. So we're now down to the bottom part of the balance sheet. And you can see that we have our capital stock which includes our preferred stock, our common stock, and then we have additional paid in capital. Okay, and these additional paid in capitals come up because many corporations will either have a par or a stated value associated with their stock, but when they actually sell the stock, it's dictated by the market, and so if they sell it for more than its par, then we're going to see that we'll have amounts that are uh, paid in excess, additional paid in capital in excess of par, in excess of any stated value. Retained earnings, we know, is going to be what? The accumulation of the net income of the company since its inception, minus, of course, what? Any dividends that have been paid out. And those are the primary uh, items affecting retained earnings, although we'll see that when we have uh, something called treasury stock, treasury stock is when the company purchases its own stock back on the open market, we're going to show that as a deduction from our stockholders' equity. And typically, we're thinking that the company will go ahead and resell that stock uh, at some later date, or they could actually retire it. And we'll take a look at those two options. But uh, when you purchase that stock, it is considered treasury stock since it has been taken out of the ownership from uh, entities outside of the company or shareholders we show that as a reduction of our stockholders' equity. And then we've been talking about our, um, what, accumulated other comprehensive income. We know that that's a component of our equity, and we're going to talk a little bit more as to the nature of items that occur there, although we're already aware of two of them from our earlier chapters. We had, what, unrealized holding gains and losses from available for sale securities, and then we had, what, our pension items 
which included our unrecognized gains and losses and our unrecognized prior service costs primarily were the two things were from pensions. And we'll very briefly talk about a couple other things that appear, okay? But this is our stockholders equity section right here. And so um, you can see that we kind of zooming in here on the uh, stock portion, okay? We have our common stock at par. We have our additional paid in capital. I guess we're looking at the whole thing in more detail now. Our retained earnings, our accumulated, or I guess this is less detail because we're what, rolling up the uh, total amounts of stock, the additional paid in capitals on those, the retained earnings, and then there's our uh, accumulated OCI. And then treasury stock, again, is a subtract off of the stockholder's equity. The idea is that we have repurchased that stock on the open market, so we would subtract it off of our shareholders' equity. The corporation has reacquired that section of ownership, so we subtract it off. Okay. Now, we've talked about accumulated other comprehensive income. We already know about what? Unrealized holding gains and losses. Okay, so that's going to be a U. Gains and losses and amendments from post retirement benefit plans. And, of course, uh, we also had the unamortized prior service costs. So that's pensions. We have uh, gains and losses from adjustments and, um, uh, I mean, you should say from derivatives. And the key derivative is something called an effective cash flow hedge that we, push, that we put down here. And then we have adjustments from foreign currency items. So if you think about the things that constitute our uh, other comprehensive income, they primarily fall into these three broad categories. Pensions, unrealized holding gains and losses, foreign currency items, and then our effective portion of a cash flow hedge, which is essentially a derivative. And if it's only take it to our other comprehensive income, they shouldn't say derivatives in general because some uh, items with derivatives don't impact, okay? And so it has to be an effective portion of a cash flow head, hedge. Guys, remember, if you're enjoying yourself, if I see you looking at your computer screen and I see happiness on your face, I know you're not looking at the uh, material from this uh, chapter. So, you know, save those things for outside of the class and focus on, um, of intermediate accounting too here, okay? Uh, and the reason I hold strong to that requirement is if you're sitting next to somebody else, they start seeing those joyous flashings coming from your screen and pretty soon they're looking at it. And all of a sudden they think, oh, I wanna look at my favorite thing. And all of a sudden I have a classroom full of people playing video games and that's not happening, okay? So stay on the, stay on the range, okay? Okay, so you can remember these by remembering Puffy, P-U-F-E, okay, Puffy. These are the items that make up my uh, other comprehensive income, okay? Now, remember, we talked uh, in our chapter 12 when we were talking about unrealized holding gains and losses, and I kind of wrote up on the uh, sideboards here that we have our statement of comprehensive income. Comprehensive income is going to be what? Net income plus the other comprehensive income items give us comprehensive income. And so you can see that we will take our net income off of our income statement. You know, we don't take it off. It's not like we don't show it there, but we copy it from our income statement and we paste it onto the um, comprehensive income statement. So we start with net income and then we start showing our other comprehensive income items. Net income gets closed to what? retain earnings, other comprehensive income gets closed to my accumulated other comprehensive income. And so we sort of park things on the balance sheet there in the stockholders equity section that we're not quite re ready to take to the income statement. Later on, like when we actually sell the security, we have a realized gain, we take it out of the balance sheet, out of the accumulated other comprehensive income and put it into our net income, into our retained earnings, right? Okay. Question on that? Okay, good. Now you come over and you take a look at an IFRS difference. And they talk about reserves, okay? And they talk about a revaluation, 
reserve. Okay. Now, if you go back to my uh, little mnemonic that I just gave you, which was puffy, I could turn this into puffer, and that would be this revaluation surplus that's what IFRS only. Okay, and so something that we do in IFRS that we do not do in US GAAP is we'll look at our assets and we'll look at the difference between the fair value of the asset and the um, carrying value of the asset. Now for US GAAP, if what? If the fair value is below the carrying value, we write the asset down to that lower fair value, right? If it's what? Fair value is above the carrying value for a capital asset, property, plant, equipment. We don't do anything. We just leave it alone, don't we? IFRS actually allows you to write up your assets above their historical costs. So let's say we look and we have an asset that's worth 100000 book value. And then we look at the uh, fair market value and it says what? It says, I don't know, 120000 We're just picking a number out of the air right here, right? What would we do? We would debit the asset for 20000 and credit OCI revaluation gain for 20000 So they literally, in IFRS, let us do what? Write up our asset above its book value. If its fair value is more, we can write it up above the book value and then what? And then if we sit there uh, and we've written it up, we can credit our OCI revaluation gain. And of course, our OCI gets closed out to accumulated OCI. So of course, the balance sheet will balance at the end of the period, right? Okay. Now, um, US GAAP doesn't allow this. And the primary reason is, you know, US GAAP is in love with the idea of historical cost, right? And the rule of conservatism and don't take gains until the re earning process is complete and all that good stuff. And so, you know, it's too much of a hit to FASB's conceptual framework to then turn around and accept this. So this is one of those areas that US GAAP will probably never uh, adopt from IFRS. We'll probably always hang on to uh, this idea of carrying assets at historical cost. Uh, I think I mentioned uh, I had the opportunity to go to uh, to China with my CPA review course, and uh, we were talking about taking the U.S. CPA exam. And one of the comments that's made is that China has adopted IFRS. At least that's the statement of the Ministry of Finance. But when we started delving into that a little bit more, you know, not in we didn't have like formal research or anything we were doing, but just in you know dinner conversation that kind of thing we find out that actually they have not completely adopted IFRS. There are some parts that they have not accepted, and one of the parts of IFRS that China has not accepted is this. China still carries its fixed assets as a historical cost, and they're not going to allow a write-up uh, for revaluation surplus. So um, it's interesting to me that the whole idea of IFRS was to have one set of high-quality accepted standards worldwide and instead, what's happened? You've got the major economy in the world, the U.S. economy, not using IFRS. You've got, what, number two, kind of cherry-picking IFRS. And then you've got some more emerging economies, true, sort of picking up IFRS in total. But uh, I think they're a long way from their stated goal of having one set of internationally accepted standards. But uh, Okay, but just know that uh, there is that small difference between, well, I don't know if it's a small difference, kind of a big difference that I want you to be aware of between U.S. GAAP and IFRS when it comes to the OCI. Okay, so what's this? Uh, which of the following items is not reported in the statement of comprehensive income as other comprehensive income gains and losses or whatever on sale of equipment would be part of our net income calculation, wouldn't it? We'd have what? We've had our revenues minus our expenses give us operating items, and then we start getting into non-operating items, which would be gains and losses on sale of equipment, interest, that sort of thing gives us net income, 
And then we start to list off our other comprehensive income items, which would be the pensions, the unrealized holding gains and losses unavailable for sales securities, the foreign currency translation adjustment, affected portion of the cash flow hedge and the revaluation surplus for our FRS only. Those are all what? Other comprehensive income items, not gains and losses on sale of equipment. Okay. Okay, good. Let's go ahead then and let's take a look at... The correct answer is C. Sorry for the slowness. I don't have my clicker. Okay. All right. Which of the following equity related terms is used under IFRS but not US GAAP? And I have no idea. I don't care. Oh, no, I do care. Let's talk to you about it, which is what? Revaluation surplus, right? So I guess that I thought I hid that question and. I guess I didn't hide it because I wanted you to be aware of what the R in puffer, which is only FRS. Okay. Okay, so let's talk about uh, corporate structure of a company since we're talking about issuing stock here. We are likely talking about corporations, okay? And uh, one of the key reasons that uh, when you start your own business that you'll go ahead and incorporate is to have limited liability, okay? So what happens? You have a corporation and you uh, incorporate, and by the way, when we incorporate, we incorporate through each state. So each incorporation is going to be incorporated through whatever state. And many corporations incorporate through Delaware because it's not as heavily regulated as say states like what, California, New York, Hawaii, believe it or not, is a highly regulated state. Can you think of anything that's uh, interesting about the states that I mentioned that uh, are more heavily regulated? If I gave you the choice of living in Delaware, California, New York, or Hawaii, Delaware would probably be the last one on that list, right? Okay. So what happens? Have you ever been to Delaware? Okay, it's nothing to write home about. I mean, it's the Delaware River is there, and Delaware River runs through uh, Philadelphia as well, and the wind comes off that river, man, I thought my face was going to freeze off, okay? Uh, that is a cold, you know what, uh, when that wind gets going off of that river, so, and that was Philadelphia, so Delaware is probably even worse. Um, you know, when you work for the federal government for 50 years, you end up in a lot of strange places over the years, okay? Um, not that Pennsylvania is that weird, Philadelphia is that weird, but you end up in places like Parkersburg, West Virginia, okay? Parkersburg, all of West Virginia has a lot of federal um, installations, and the reason they do is uh, there was a senator named Robert Byrd, he's dead now, but he knew all the rules of the Senate. So if you wanted to get something passed through the Senate, it'd be a good idea to go over and kiss his ring and say, please show me how to navigate this process to get something through the Senate. And so he was a old West Virginian and he'd say he had Parkinson's and so he'd probably say something like, well, okay, I'll help you, but you're gonna vote to move the Office of Public Debt Accounting to Parkersburg now, aren't you? So what would happen over the years, you end up with nice federal jobs in West Virginia, okay? And so as an auditor, we end up following the money trail and it goes through West Virginia at some point in time. So uh, anyway, but uh, so, you know, the state sometimes will try to find a, um, I mean, corporations will try to find a state that's maybe a little bit more sympathetic to their cause to incorporate it. But they incorporate through each state. And uh, so you go ahead and you incorporate and when you do, you will be allowed to issue shares of stock. Now what happens? Something happens and the corporation goes under, there's amounts that aren't paid, um, there's some accident and individuals are harmed by a product or an accident at the factory or whatever, what happens? Your liability is limited to your investment in the corporation. Okay, so your own personal assets, your home, that sort of thing, let's say, would be protected and wouldn't be subject to any sort of, uh, you know, lawsuits or, um, you know, claims uh, against the corporate assets. Okay, uh, ease of raising capital. 
what happens here? Well, if I have shares of stock that I can issue, I can do what? I can probably go to the stock exchanges, register with them, and individuals I've never even met could potentially go ahead and buy some of the stocks. So just a couple of the advantages here to corporate. Okay, Some of the disadvantages, again, I've mentioned regulation. And uh, not only are you regulated by the state, uh, now you start getting federal regulation. How does the federal government end up stepping into this? How does the U.S. federal government end up coming in and saying, well, since you're a corporation, now you're going to be regulated at the federal level as well? How do they manage that? I mean, you registered with the state, didn't you? There's just such a thing as state rights. You hear that all the time. You say, oh, the federal government has no right to tell the states what to do. Of course, people, it depends on whose ox is getting gored. If people don't want to do whatever the federal statute is or whatever the federal government's trying to say, they claim state rights. If they want the what, federal government to override the state, then they say, well, it's the Constitution. The federal government should step in here, right? And the classic one is marijuana. Right, the states now are starting to uh, state by state approve it, and at the same time, the federal government, particularly the current Attorney General Jeff Sessions, is sitting there saying, "No, he thinks marijuana is the worst thing that's ever happened," and so he wants a federal law to come in. Meanwhile, he's probably the first guy that would step up and claim state rights for other things that uh, you know many people would think the federal government should step in. So again. People use this as a sword to cut whatever way they want to at any point in time, this idea of state rights. But uh, how does the federal government get in and start regulating entities, corporations, that have been incorporated through the state laws? What gives them the right? Well, what they use is the idea of interstate commerce, right? It's the same reason the federal government can regulate transportation between state lines. Anytime transactions go between state lines, you have to have what? a higher level of government that oversees that entire process. And so the federal government gets involved. And as an accountant, we're interested in the Security Exchange Commission. The SEC is the federal entity that regulates the accounting aspect. Okay? So advantage, uh, disadvantage what? Increased regulation. Now you're going to step into the federal arena for your regulation. Double taxation is the other one that you've probably heard about and that what? Corporations are seen as separate legal entities, okay? And there's a lot of debate around that. The Supreme Court has seen that a corporation is a separate legal entity, and you have the case of uh, Citizens United, where a corporation, since it's being seen as an entity, can give unlimited contributions to um, campaigns for uh, public office because they're seen as individual entities, okay? Prior to that, um, there was some stipulation as to how much they could uh, contribute. Now they can contribute just like an individual can based on that Supreme Court decision. So corporations are seen as separate legal entities, and so they have to pay tax. So the corporation pays tax, and then later on, when they distribute the dividend to the shareholders, although there are some limitations on that, but at some level, uh, corporate dividends are then taxed. Uh, so what happens? You pay the tax originally through the corporation, and then what? Then the shareholders essentially pay tax again through the amount of dividends that they've received on that. So a couple of disadvantages. Okay. Okay, good. Now you come over, and uh, you could have entities that aren't quite corporations, but want to basically protect themselves to a certain extent. So they form as a limited liability company, limited liability partnership. Okay. So what happens here? You'll see LLP sometimes. And what happens here? Now, even though they have a partnership, they have you know, uh, several owners that hold a share, um, they, uh, they uh, organize the business in such a way that they are only limited to their investments. So they don't formally create a corporation. They create a partnership, and then they go ahead and uh, create a limited liability partnership to protect themselves uh, beyond just their investment. Okay? A lot of CPA firms go under LLP or LLC, Limited Liability Corporation, in which uh, they bring the shareholders together, and there's a small number of shareholders in the uh, 
CPA firms. Some of you may end up being a shareholder by becoming partner once you make it through the uh, process of making the partner. It takes about seven, eight years to make partner in a CPA firm and then you'll be a partner, but you'll be limited only to your investment in the uh, partnership. Okay. All right, so you take a look at a uh, couple of the advantages, disadvantages. Uh, when we incorporate with the state, we will create something called the Articles of Incorporation. It'll describe our board of directors, our responsibility. It'll talk about how many shares we are authorized to issue, how many sh uh, shares we are authorized to issue in the corporation. That's the shares that are authorized. Okay. Okay, now, when we have shares of stock, we have something called common shares. Now, common shares um, have an advantage in that they have the right to vote, okay? The disadvantage of common shares is that what? When dividends are declared, other classes of stockholders will be paid their dividend before the common shares will. That's called preferred shareholders, and we'll talk about them in a minute. So that's a disadvantage. An advantage of being a common share, I mean, a dis, another disadvantage advantage is you get to vote. Another disadvantage of being a common shareholder is that you're last in line. If there's a liquidation of the company, the common shareholders go last. And I mentioned before what? First in line is who? Huh? Uh, I'm not sure if I mentioned before. First in line are the accountants and the lawyers, right? Did I mention that before? Because nobody knows who gets what until the accountants and the lawyers go through and sift through and separate the dead from the living, right? Then we go and we start going to secured creditors. Well, we'd actually have to pay any taxes that are due next, and then we'd have to pay uh, employees their wages, and then we'd start going to secure, secured creditors, those who have a specific claim against a specific asset like a building or something, then general creditors, then preferred shareholders, then the common shareholders go last, right? So essentially, you're last in line. You're probably going to get cents on the dollar if the company's liquidating, right? Okay, so that's a major disadvantage of being a common shareholder, but you do get to vote, okay? So you vote for the board, uh, board of directors, etc. okay? There's also something called a preemptive right, and with a preemptive right that could come with common stock, if we're in a situation where they're going to issue more shares, they may create an opportunity where you can acquire enough shares to maintain whatever your share is of the overall ownership of the company. So if they're going to issue more shares, you can acquire enough so that if you had 10% before the issue, you can do what? Keep your 10% uh, share uh, by acquiring additional shares. Now, this is how... Uh, I don't know if I should get into sports in here. Um, you guys have heard of the Oakland Raiders, okay, the football team. There was the owner of the Raiders, it was a famous guy, Al Davis, okay. And Al Davis started out as a very low-level shareholder of the Raiders, and over a period of about 10 years, he became the owner of this NFL team. So he was buying the shares before the NFL was that big, and he would buy the shares, and he had a preemptive right to continue to buy shares as more shares were sold. So what would happen? As other individuals would drop off and sell their stock, he would do what? He would go ahead and continue to reacquire as more shares were issued, but as others dropped out, over time he became the primary shareholder and ended up owning the team. And of course, that was in the 70s. And from the 70s to now, the NFL was nowhere near the huge uh, entity it is now back in the 70s, and so he ended up, what, owning something that was worth quite a bit, okay? So in a preemptive uh, right is something that if you have that, it's something to keep a, a close eye on and exercise so that you maintain your share, and potentially as others drop off, you could become the primary shareholder, okay? All right, now you come over, and uh, we also have what we call preferred shares, okay? Now, preferred shares, what? Um, if there are dividends, okay, we have to prepare, pre we have to pay the, pre yeah. we have to pay the preferred shareholders 
before we pay the common shareholders. And we're going to see how that distribution will work here in a minute. Okay. Um, and then if there is a dissolution, as I've mentioned, the preferred shareholders will get in line before the uh, common shareholders. So that puts you in a position where you say, well, then I'm just going to buy preferred stock, right? What's the disadvantage? No voting right. Okay, you do not have a voting right if you're a preferred shareholder. And so, uh, even though you might have more security there, um, you know, if you're trying to, um, if you're trying to direct the uh, direction of the company, um, then you might want to have common shares over preferred shares. Okay. Now, when we look, well, what is this? Okay. This is a poor presentation, okay? Because why wouldn't we maybe want to have both of those images on the screen at the same time, right? So if you're sitting there, well, we can fix that. All right, you can see that. That's like a little better presentation. That's how it looked better when I looked at it. I didn't look at it in the slideshow before. I prefer this way of looking at it. So when we have what? Preferred shareholders, we could have cumulative or non-cumulative. Let's start with that one. Cumulative <laughs> means that if a dividend isn't declared and paid in one year, it uh, accumulates into the next year. The amount that accumulates into the next year is called dividends in arrears. And what will happen is those will build up over time and nothing can be paid out to any of the other classes, for our purposes, the common shareholders, until we catch up dividends in arrears. That's considered cumulative stock, okay? Now, you could also be participating, okay? And uh, I don't see that these are mutually exclusive. That's why I wanted to move it off of that slide, because you can be both. You can be what? Fully participating and cumulative, okay? So what does fully participating mean? Fully participating means that after we have paid out any dividends that need to go to the preferred shareholders, say any amounts in arrears, we pay them out, then we catch up our common shareholders so that they have received a dividend that is equal in kind to what the preferred shareholders got, and then anything that is left over after we've now caught up our common shareholders will be, cons uh, will be uh, distributed between the common shareholders and the preferred shareholders, okay? So you can have what? You can have cumulative, fully participating stock, okay? And uh, that'll mean that, of course, we pay off any cumulative dividends, then we catch up the common shareholders, and then anything that's left gets divided proportionately between the uh, common and the prefer preferred shareholders, okay? So let's go back to the slideshow here, and I have an example as to how the cumulative preferred works here. Okay, and so let's just go ahead and once again, I don't know why they had to split those up. Okay, uh, and we'll get into that more, but let's just go ahead and make sure we understand something about par value. Okay, and uh, par value is basically an arbitrary value per share of stock that is assigned by the corporation, usually in their um, articles of incorporation. Okay, and uh, it's usually set at a fairly nominal amount, say five dollars per share. Okay, now what happens? Most companies, of course, will sell their stock for more than par. So let's say we're selling our stock at fifteen dollars per share. And um, I think you all know this, but let's say we sell 10 shares. 10 times $15 per share is going to be $150. So we will debit cash for what? 150, the amount that's coming in. And we said that the um, par value is $5. Right? Did I say the par value is $5? Okay. So the common stock will be 50. And the amount that is in excess 
of the par value is credited to additional paid in capital. We'll abbreviate that as APIC, additional paid in capital in excess of par. Additional paid in capital in excess of par is the longest name of an account in the history of accounting and also the most descriptive, right? Because it is additional paid in capital in excess of the par value, which is $10 times these, uh, uh, I mean, yeah, $10 that are left times these 10 shares, that's 100 bucks, right? Okay. Now we're going to see here coming up on a slide that some stock doesn't use a par value, they'll, but they'll call it a stated value. And it's the most annoying thing in the world. If I was president, I would say, from now on, all stock has a par value. There. End of discussion. We don't have to worry about it anymore, right? But some stock, they don't give it a par value, but then they turn around and say, well, it is a stated value. And if it's a stated value, then what? We would credit the common stock, say the stated value is five, credit the common stock, credit additional paid in capital in excess of now saying par stated value. Some stock has no par value and no stated value, okay? Now, um, I'm telling you, if you're saying this is not interesting, I know, okay? I mean, they should pay, play this, this, I should send this into the Who Cares channel on the radio and they'll just play this all day. They say, we found the best Who Cares presentation ever right here, okay? Because it's much ado about nothing. But if there's no par, no stated value, we do what? We debited cash 150 and we credit what? We credit common stock for the full 150. At the end of the day, the balance sheet still balances and we still have a stockholder's equity that's exactly the same, don't we? So if I was president, I'd either say all stock has a par value or the stock has no par value, whichever, but I'm not going to sit here and waste my time with also the stated value thing in between. Okay? All right, so we come over. And uh, take a look at, you know, another example, $10 share, $10 per, uh, uh, $10 per share it's sold for, par value is a dollar, so we credit the common stock for 100 credit the paid in capital in excess of par for the remainder, right? If there is no par value, then what? Everything goes to common stock. Okay, all right, come over, and we could have shares that are issued for something other than stock, I mean, excuse me, cash, because shares are the stock. We could have shares of stock that are issued for something other than cash. Now, how would this happen? Let's say you're a startup corporation, you're just starting out. You don't have a lot of uh, a lot of um, interest in uh, people buying your stock for cash, or you're having a cash shortage right now. You don't have any cash, but to incorporate, you have to incur some legal fees or something, right? So the attorney is going to come in. They're going to do some work for you, and they say, "Well, what? How can you pay me? What credit do you have? How are you going to be able to pay me?" And you say, "Well, I don't have a lot of cash, but will you take some of the shares of the stock?" The attorney looks at that and says, okay, you know, I kind of see where you're going with this business. You know, you've developed what these days, I guess everyone wants to develop an app of some sort that's going to change the world, whatever. And I believe in this app. And so, okay, just issue me the stock, right? Well, what would happen? You would go ahead and debit the expense for whatever the guy wants to charge you, say, $1,500. You would credit the common stock at the par value. If it's 100 shares and it's $5 per share, that's going to be 500 And you'd credit the additional paid in capital for the 1000 right? Okay. So the th key thing that we have to understand here is what should we use in that example. Okay. Now, I jumped down to the third bullet, really, and this is a, hi a hierarchical list. Okay. This is the best. This is not as good down here, okay? Um, and I jumped down to the third one here and that whatever you would have been charged for the service here, right? Debited legal expense, credit the common stock, credit the APIC for the difference between whatever the guy was charging you and the um, par value of the stock goes to the additional paid in capital, okay? But if you have a quoted market price 
for your stock, well, that's a better measure than whatever this guy is saying he wants to charge you for this service, right? And so you might go ahead and use the quoted value of your stock in however many shares you give them to determine what the appropriate amount is for the legal fees, okay? Um, if there are, um, a, if the stocks aren't quoted, but you have recently issued them, that could be a good measure. So we're just looking for what? measures as to how you'll determine the value of what, whatever it is. An independent appraisal of the asset that's being received, okay? Not what the person is telling you they think this thing is worth. They're going to turn around and they're going to sit here and tell you, well, I want, uh, you know, $50,000 for this piece of property. Meanwhile, you know, an appraiser looks at that piece of property and says it's not worth $50,000. So it would have to be what? An independent appraiser, not the asking price of what the person wants. Okay. or other evidence that's available. Okay, so the key is that what? The most independent value is what we're looking for here. And if stock is being traded on the market daily, then that's going to be what? That's going to be the most objective measure. Um, and so we would probably use that if we had quoted market prices. Okay, okay good. Now you come over and you take a look. And they tell us that uh, the market price of the stock is ten dollars per share. Okay, and what's happened? We are acquiring, acquiring property, plant, and equipment for that, and we're going to issue a million shares. So we're going to get what? We're going to bring the property in at ten million. We'll credit the common stock for a million. That's for the uh, the million shares times dollar par value. And then we'll credit paid in capital in excess of par for nine million. That's the difference between what? I don't think I need to do that. Ten minus one equals nine per share. Okay, and that goes in times a million shares. That goes into the additional paid in capital. Okay, so the value of the property was determined on the quoted market price of the stock there because that's the most objective uh, measure. Okay. Okay, good. Share buybacks, okay? Now, what we're talking about here is where the company goes into the open market and repurchases their own stock on the open market. Can they do that? Right, they just go ahead and offer up the cash to buy the stock, okay? And so what happens? We will do this because we are trying to reduce the supply of shares on the market. If we reduce the supply of shares on the market, what does economic theory tell us is going to happen? The price should go up. So maybe we're trying to get the price up on the shares of stock. So then when we go ahead and reissue them, we'll get more capital generated into the company, right? Okay. Um, there could be various reasons. Maybe, maybe there's somebody out there that's trying to gobble up all the outstanding shares so that they can, can become the uh, primary shareholder and what? Fire everybody and take over the company. So we're trying to, you know, cut them off of the past by buying up that stock before they can, okay? So there could be a variety of issues as to why we would buy back the shares. Now, when we buy back the shares, there's two things that are going to happen. One is we could go ahead and retire the share. Okay, this is my, they call this inner channel redundancy and that I spoke about this slide before I put it up. So I failed on my inner channel redundancy because I was speaking of this slide on the previous slide, okay? And so I just want to go over and uh, put this part down, which is when I buy back the stock, okay, my options are to either retire that stock, okay, or I will um, temporarily take it off the market and I will reissue it later. If that's the case, then I will call it treasury stock. Okay. Now let's just go ahead and take a look at uh, what's going on here. And with this example, we have a company that had common stock of uh, 100 million. That was 100 million shares at a dollar each. We have paid in capital an excess of par of 900 million. So this stock must have what? must have a par of a dollar and apparently has been being sold on average anyway for what? $10 a share? 
Okay, and then the 10 minus the 1 is the 9 times the 100 million shares, we would end up with 900 million. Now, we have paid in capital share repurchase, and this is extra money that we have accumulated in our share repurchase paid in capital from times when we have reacquired the stock and we have reacquired the stock at a lower price than we had originally issued it. So we've built up some additional paid in capital for our reacquired stock and then of course we have our retained earnings which is the accumulation of what our earnings since the beginning of the company minus out essentially any dividends, right? Okay, any distribution of capital. Now we go ahead and we reacquire a million shares of the common stock. And when we reacquire those million shares of the common stock, there's a couple different options we're going to look at. One is we go ahead and we reacquire it at $7 per share. Now, if you look at the retirement first, guys, notice the retirement in the common stock and the additional paid in capital part of the equation is simply a reversal of what we would have done when we sold the stock, right? We would have debited cash, we would have credited the common stock at par, we would have credited the additional paid in capital for any amounts over par, right? All we're doing here is reducing it for these, what was it, a million shares? With me so far? Okay, then what? Since we reacquired them at seven, we obviously are going to uh, debit our cash, and this is kind of a, I mean, uh, excuse me, credit our cash, because we have done what? We've paid out cash to reacquire these $7 per share, right? So we'll credit the cash, and since we reacquired the shares for less than their original purchase price, we consider that what? The original sale price, we consider that what? A additional paid in capital, which is basically the number you have to put in to plug this journal entry so that it balances, right? Okay, so we go ahead, we take the what? We take the common shares out at their par, whatever number of shares times their par, whatever it was we had originally issued them at um, minus the par, the amount that went to paid in capital. So we go ahead and we debit that out. And then we go ahead and um, we have to credit the cash, obviously, for seven. And anything's left to make this journal entry balance since we issued the stock, repurchased the stock, I should say, for less than we issued it, we consider that an additional paid in capital. Okay. Now, notice that what? The common stock and the paid in capital has been removed from the balance sheet, hasn't it? Okay. And all we've done is replace that with cash. And of course, this uh, additional paid in capital, which is basically taking some amount out of the paid in capital and excess of par and putting it into the share repurchase account. And then if it's treasury stock, we will simply do what? We will simply debit the treasury stock for whatever we paid for it and credit the cash. Okay, now if it's treasury stock, we're thinking we're probably going to resell it later, right? Okay, now you come over and you take a look at, oh, I guess I should have put that up. I was speaking that, but it would have been helped if we would have had the visual on. There was the original issue, right? And you can see how what? How the retirement part here is simply a reversal of what we had put in at the time we had issued the stock. Okay, okay good. Now you come in and you take a look at the case two now, case two, they're reacquiring the stock for what? For more than its original um, issue price. So we're essentially doing what? We're essentially distributing some of our uh, either retain earnings or that, remember that uh, A pick on repurchase? We're essentially distributing that to shareholders if we're buying the stock for what? for more than we had originally purchased it for. It's like a distribution to shareholders, isn't it? Okay. And so if that's the case, and I don't know why they get funky with how they let out this <laughs> journal entry. Okay. Um, what's happening here? Is that the whole journal entry now? Just give me the whole journal entry, please. 
Okay, and so what happens? We go ahead, and if it's the treasury stock, let's look at that first. Notice it's a different dollar amount because it's thirteen dollars now, right? But it's still debiting the treasury stock and crediting what cash, right? So that didn't change other than the dollar amount change. For the retirement, notice the part where we're taking that out of our common stock is the same. And remember, if we had some amount in the paid in capital share repurchase account, well, we're taking that out of there now because we're saying, hey, that is not an additional paid in capital anymore because we're reacquiring our stock, we're buying treasury stock for more than we had originally paid for it. If there's still an amount that's needed to balance this out, we take that out of retained earnings because we're essentially saying it's a almost like a dividend, isn't it? It's a distribution to the shareholders because we're paying them back. We're buying the stock for more than we had originally issued it for. Okay. So the pecking order here, what? When you acquire the stock for more is to what? In both cases, more or less, we're going to do what? We're going to sit there and we're going to take amounts out of the common stock, okay? And then what? If we're requiring it for more, any amounts that are sitting in the paid in capital uh, share repurchase get liquidated, get depleted until that's down to zero. And then any additional amounts go against what? Retain earnings. If there was nothing in the paid in capital share repurchase, then everything goes against the retain earnings, right? Right? Okay. There is no such thing, guys, as creating retain earnings. So just go back out of this. If you just go back here to this, where the hell am I now? Okay, if you uh, take a look here, notice that if I have acquired it for less than the original purchase price, the excess goes into this paid in capital and excess of par account. Um, it, it, um, not paid in capital, it's just paid in capital share repurchase. Nothing goes into retained earnings as a result of this. It all gets extra, gets accumulated what? In this paid in capital. Retained earnings doesn't start coming into play until what? until we start reacquiring the stock for more than the original purchase price, then we start having amounts that come out of retained earnings after we have fully distributed any amounts that are uh, sitting in the paid in capital share repurchase. So can retained earnings increase as a result of these transactions? Can retained earnings increase as a result of these transactions? They cannot, right? Any additional amounts go to what? go to paid in capital share repurchase first and then if we later on when we build those up they're sitting there and then later on we sell some different shares of um, treasury stock and we are acquire some additional shares of treasury stock and we require them for more than their original purchase price first we're going to go against that what paid in capital share repurchased and then if there's any amounts that are still needed that comes out of retained earnings okay okay good come over and let's take a look at uh, purchase of treasury stock um, again it's considered a temporary and the idea is that we will later on do what resell any shares of stock that we have purchased okay so when we're dealing with the treasury stock notice if you look back at that uh, transaction that we were looking at before, we had what? We had the um, treasury stock was 13, I guess. Now we're just talking about the treasury stock example now. And so we went ahead and we did a debit to the treasury stock, a credit to cash. Some stockholders' equity is a credit. The debit is going to go to the um, treasury stock, but we report it down there in stockholders' equity, so it's a subtract. So what, are you guys getting tired or something? You guys getting tired? This is cell phone checking time? Is this the moment, should I stop talking and let you all check your cell phones real quick? Okay, Okay. so what happens? We sit here and we have what? We have this debit to treasury stock uh, that we made and we don't report it as an asset. 
we reported down. We gave up cash the asset. We reported it as a negative amount down in the stockholders' equity, right? Okay. Okay, good. Come over. And uh, let's take a look at the resale of the shares. And uh, after we have retired these, if we resell them, um, it's the easiest thing in the world. You simply issue the stock. You issue it for $14 before you had retired it. Now you bring it out of retirement. You simply do what? Reissue the stock the way you would if it was an original issue. That's a piece of cake, isn't it? And if you are sitting there and it's the treasury stock, that's pretty easy too. And which what? You got cash. You credit the treasury stock account for whatever you had required, uh, reacquired it for. And then if there is what? An amount more that you resell it for than what you had originally required it for. That goes into the additional paid in capital share repurchase. Can you give me the example on the next slide? Yeah, if you sell it for less than um, you had originally required it for, now just focusing on the treasury stock for a second, we're going to do what? We're going to go ahead and we'll debit cash for the 10. We got the treasury, credit the treasury stock for the 13 that was sitting in there. We go ahead and any amounts that were in the paid and capital repurchase gets what? Gets completely depleted. And if we still need more, it comes out of retained earnings. Because again, we're seeing that as a distribution to the shareholders and that what? We are ba basically letting them reacquire the stock for less than we had purchased it from them. And so we consider that a distribution. Retirement and it comes out of retained earnings. The retirement is easy. Whatever the cash is you got, par value, difference goes to additional paid in capital. Question? Okay, good. So what's happening here? Um, this company goes ahead and requires 3,000 shares of the common stock at $55 per share. Or uh, yeah, three uh, fifty dollars per share in twenty uh, nineteen. They reissue thousand shares at seventy five dollars per share, which is the following would be included in the uh, journal entry for the twenty nineteen reacquisition. And of course, we'll debit cash for seventy five. We'll credit the treasury stock for whatever it was we had originally paid for it and uh, we have this what? We have this uh, 160, 165 million would have been um, the, uh, the amount for the uh, uh, one third of the original issue. Why are they dividing by three? Oh, because it's 3,000 shares and it's what? A thousand are being reissued. So it's one third of the 165 million. Difference is going to go to what? to the A pick. Okay. They divided it by three because they said what 165 million was the total in treasury stock and they required what a thousand out of the three thousand shares. Okay. Okay. Again, uh, it goes to A pick repurchase treasury stock, you just credit it back for whatever you paid for it. Okay, take a look at this one now. And uh, this one, we have now um, they want us to see what would happen to the different accounts up here. And they want us to talk about the paid in capital in excess of par. And they want us to um, talk about the uh, the uh, retain earnings, okay? And so we're taking a look here and we have the um, shares are being what? Balance sheet included following shareholders equity on January 1st, 2019, Chun purchased and retired a million shares for 9 million immediately after the purchase of the shares. So the balances in the paid in capital nexus of par retain earnings so they're going to go ahead and acquire a million shares for $9. So that gives me the credit to cash. We're going to go ahead and take the common stock out at its original um, par. 
and then we will completely deplete any amount that was sitting in what a pick in excess of par um, and we have what the a pick in excess of par 540 and they divide it by the 90 million because there's what 90 million shares that are actually outstanding so for a million shares that's going to be six million any additional amounts have to do what have to come out of retain earnings so we go ahead and we back that out of retain earnings for the two dollars so retain earnings is sort of like the last item you figure out there and uh, that gives us then the answer here which is the 540 minus the six and the 280 minus the two okay okay um let's take a look at our retain earnings okay retain earnings typically has a credit balance it could have a debit balance if we've had what losses or we paid out a lot of dividends and created a debit balance credit balance is what retain earnings starts with zero beginning of the company plus net income over the years minus what essentially any dividends although now we understand that what if there's been situations where we have acquired treasury stock for more than the original purchase price that can also go against retain earnings as well right and then you end up with the ending balance in your uh, retain earnings okay so we come over and retain earnings is of course the accumulated undistributed net income results in a credit balance in retained earnings. This, of course, is ignoring any treasury stock transactions that might have reduced my retained earnings. Okay. All right, dividends. And um, if we pay dividends in excess of the retained earnings, you know what? Let's stop there for a minute. Let's take a break right now before... Uh, we get too far into this dividend thing. So we'll stop here with dividends for a second and we'll come back. Let's come back at 12, guys. So whatever you got to do, do it quickly. We'll come back at 12 and we'll wrap this up and hopefully uh, get through the quiz as well. Okay. have uh, time to look at some of the if not the entire quiz so um, let's just go ahead and pick up where we left off now talking about dividends okay and so when we have our dividends um, our dividends are going to be paid out of our retained earnings and if you think about it it makes sense net income increases my retained earnings income is my earnings and when I distribute it I distribute my earnings through a dividend so that reduces my retained earnings now if a company provides dividends that are in excess of the amounts that are in retained earnings then we consider that a um, liquidating dividend liquidating dividend essentially is going to go against my paid in capital Okay, so if you pay more than what's in the retained earnings, you're essentially returning back what the additional paid in capital that was excess of the par. So you're um, calling that liquidating dividend because you're essentially paying out all the assets of the uh, corporation to your shareholders at that point. Okay, now we come over and um, sometimes. We will want to disclose if dividend, I mean, excuse me, if retained earnings are being set aside for some purpose. We can either disclose that, or as we mentioned, I forget which chapter, we can make a formal journal entry in which we'll do what? Debit the unappropriate retained earnings and credit appropriate retained earnings to show that we're setting those aside, right? And kind of sort of like a reservation of the retained earnings. And we do that. So shareholders aren't looking at this big buildup of unappropriate retained earnings and thinking, okay, the dividend is coming soon. We want them to realize that there's going to be, um, that there's some that's being set aside for some purpose. Okay. Now, um, cash dividends are pretty much what you learned about in, um, you know, in introductory. 
to accounting in which we have what? We have the board of directors will declare that a dividend is to be paid. At that time, we will show that we have dividends. We will show that we have a uh, dividend payable. Okay? So let's just go ahead and uh, put on the board. When the dividend is declared, okay, let's see that. I don't want to get rid of the ones that get right, otherwise, I'll keep picking up the same pin. So that's right. So when the dividend is declared, we will debit our dividend for, I don't know, $5,000, just making the number up. The credit dividend payable because there's going to be some time between the time that we actually declare the dividend and where we pay the dividend out. There's usually a period there while we settle up the record to make sure we know who is holding the stock at a particular date and that's who we will pay the dividend to. Now. At the end of the year, and the um, material here in these slides sort of ignores this setting up of the dividend, we have an account called dividend because what? When we prepare our statement of retained earnings, statement of retained earnings, is going to show what? Beginning retained earnings, whatever that is, plus what? What do we add to our retained earnings? Does something get added to retained earnings that you can think of? We're going to, good. We're going to add our net income. Less what? You don't know. Less dividends. And so we need to know what the dividends were for the period, don't we? And in accounting, anything you want to keep track of, you create an account for, don't you? And so we'll go ahead and we'll show the dividends. And then assuming we didn't have any of those other things with treasury stock, we would have an ending balance in retained earnings, whatever that is, right? Isn't that our statement of retained earnings? Okay. So, have we prepared our financial statement now? Have we prepared the statement of retained earnings now? Is this my statement of retained earnings? Is it prepared now? So, I don't need that dividend account anymore, do I? So, what am I going to do? I'll go ahead and I will debit retained earnings for 5000 and credit the dividend, right? To close the dividend account because I keep track of my dividend account by year, don't I? Hello? Okay. So what the book does is the book kind of just sidesteps all that and forgets all that, I guess because they didn't want to talk about it because they wanted us to get out on time. Okay, so what happens? If you look at this whole journal entry, then we could have really just done what? Debited retained earnings for 5000 and credited what? Credited the dividend payable. For five thousand. Would have that given me the same thing? Is this the same thing? Is that whole one two step then went through? Right? Okay. Now that's at the declaration date. We give it we uh debit retainer earnings, we credit the dividend payable, just sort of sidestepping all this part. That's at the declaration date. So when the dividend is declared, we'll debit retain earnings, just making this number up, for 5000 we'll credit dividend payable, right? for 5,000. And let's say that happens on December 23rd, year one. Now we'll go through a process where we'll settle up who holds the stock 
at a particular date. That's called the date of record. And that's who we're going to decide to pay, who's going to receive this dividend, whoever holds the stock at that date, right? There's no entry required for that. It's more of a what? More of a record keeping process where we just keep track of who is holding those shares at that point in time. That's who we're going to pay the dividend to. And then we'll have something called the X dividend date. And all that says is look, if you buy the stock after this X dividend date, you ain't getting the dividend. Okay, so if our date of record is say the 13th, August 13th, uh, we'll give two more days for people still to acquire the stock. And if they still haven't paid the stock, and I don't know why I'm using August, why well, I'm using August because this is the month of August, it's not working very well in my example right now. Let's say day of record is. January 7th, year two now, okay? So we're sitting there and we're saying, whoever holds the stock on January 7th, year two, that's who we're going to issue the dividend to. That's for everyone who already holds the stock, right? Okay, then what? Then we will give a couple more days for anyone that wants to acquire that stock. That's called the ex-dividend date, January 9th. So that's kind of the final people that get into the boat that are gonna be paid this stock, right? And again, there's no entry on January 9th because we're just waiting for the last few people to get into the ARC or whatever, right? And then what? Then we will go ahead and we'll pay the dividend, say, on January 15th. And when we pay the dividend, we'll do what? We'll debit dividend payable for how much was it supposed to be? Five thousand, and we'll credit cash for the five thousand. Okay. So the terms up here are what? Declaration date. That's the date that we debit retain earnings. So my retain earnings was reduced in what? In year one, wasn't it? When it was declared. The rest of this is just housekeeping and the final what? Payoff of a liability that had been set up in the prior year, isn't it? Okay. Okay, good. So you come over and um, we have the date of record, which is the date that we will pay the dividend to specific owners. Then we'll have this X, X dividend date, which is usually a couple days after that we'll wait for uh, anyone else that wants to buy the stock to acquire the stock at that point in time. And then we'll go ahead finally and we will uh, pay the dividend, okay? So let's just look at this cash dividend here, which is basically the same thing I just wrote on the board. I don't know. I didn't know I was gonna do that example on the board. There's no point in going through this. It's the same thing, right? Okay. Okay, good. Let's go ahead then and let's take a look at uh, how dividends will work on the preferred shares. And remember that we said that uh, dividends have to be paid to the preferred shareholders before anything can be sh sh paid to the common shareholders if it's a cumulative dividend, right? Okay. So we come over and we have what? We have this common stock of $3 million, our additional paying capital. Preferred stock is an 8% preferred stock. Now, the way you calculate the dividend on the preferred stock is to take whatever the par value is of that stock, which is what? It's uh, $6 million. times what? 0 0.08 means that we're supposed to pay these guys, what's that, 480000 a year? Did I do my math right? We're supposed to pay them $480,000 a year on this preferred stock. Now the first year uh, when you read, they tell us 
that they declared dividend of what? 360, didn't they? So if they declared a dividend of 360, then we still owe these guys what? 120? And 120 goes into the arrears. Arrears and it's what, 120? Now this is not an account, guys. This is just a side record that we're keeping as to how much is in the arrears. There's no journal entry for the amount that goes into the arrears, right? We'll pay the dividend by doing what? Deputy retainer earnings, crediting the dividend payable, deputy dividend payable, credit the cash, right? But we know that we have 120 in arrears now, don't we? Okay? So then we go into, so notice everything goes to the preferred shareholders up here on the slide. Nothing goes to the common shareholders because we spent everything, didn't we? The whole 360 on the preferred shareholders. Okay. So then what happens? Then we get a dividend of 500 the next year. And again, because this is cumulative stock, we have to pay the 8% when it's accumulated. We have to either pay it or accumulate. And so we declare a dividend. It's uh, 480 is what they get. We declare a dividend of what? 500. Okay. So we are able to give them their whole 480 for this year. So there's nothing left that's owed for this year. And then we have what? We have an additional twenty thousand that we can still give them, and so that additional twenty thousand that we can still give them comes off of the amount that's in the arrears. So now the arrears has how much? Hundred thousand, because we were able to catch some of that up, weren't we? Right. Okay. So notice the whole five hundred thousand goes four eighty for this year plus twenty that's catching us up for last year that we hadn't paid yet, right? Okay, and then we finally declare a dividend of what? Of 700 the next year. Okay, so when we get that 700 the next year, we still have to pay them, and I can do the calculation again. We know we have to pay them what? 480 every year. And now we've got enough left over to do what? To catch up and pay them for the amounts that were in arrears. <coughs> and so we go ahead and we back that off. So 580 minus 700 leaves what? 120. That can now finally go to the common shareholders because we have now caught up the preferred shareholders and any remaining amount is going to go to the uh, common shareholders now, right? Okay? Okay, good. Now, what we just described for our preferred stock is a cumulative preferred stock. It accumulated, didn't it? From year to year, we had to uh, catch up finally, okay? Before we could pay the, before we could pay the common shareholder. Preferred stock, guys, does not have to be cumulative. If it's non-cumulative, they don't declare a dividend, they lose their 480 that year. They don't get anything, so nothing accumulates, right? Okay. You could also have fully participating preferred stock. What happens here? With the fully participating, we will first pay our uh, cumulative fully participating, we will first do what? Pay our preferred shareholders what they have coming, this 480, okay? Then we will go ahead and catch up our common shareholders by paying them the percentage that we have given to the preferred shareholders. And then if any amount is left over, instead of it all going to the common shareholders, then the preferred and the common shareholders will share in that based on the relative proportion of the total number of shares um, that each one holds. Okay. So if you come over, 
and take a look at this example that I stole and borrowed from some other material. Uh, for some reason, the book completely skipped in the slides. I don't know if it's in the text itself, but in the slides, they completely skipped the idea of fully participating preferred, but uh, it's pretty easy. And so we have cash dividends of 110,000. And um, but let's just look up uh, Samuel Company issue 100,000 shares of $5 par common stock and 25,000 shares of $10 par fully participating 8% cumulative preferred stock. No dividends were paid in year one, and then they paid dividends of 101 in year two. And we want to figure out how much uh, each class of stock is going to get. So we have what? We have the 101, and we have to catch them up for year one, the preferred, don't we? So we catch them up for that year one, the 20,000. Then we go ahead and we pay them out what we would have to pay them for year two, right? So they've been caught up any amounts in arrears. And then we go ahead and we catch up the common shareholders. Now notice how we do that. 100,000 shares, $5 par. We take that par now times the 8%, and that catches them up, at least on a percentage basis, right? As to what we paid the uh, preferred shareholders. Now there's 21,000 left. And since it's fully participating, we have to what? Give some to the common shareholders and some to the preferred shareholders. So, oops. So all we have to do now is what? There were a total of 750,000 shares out there. It was what? Uh, I mean, not shares, but dollars. 100,000 times five is 500,000. And $10 times 25 is 250, right? So that's a total of 750, of which, what, a quarter, 250,000 of that 750 goes of the 21,000 that was left, right? There's 21,000 that was left, goes to the preferred, and what, 75% of that's going to go to my, uh, or not, it's, uh, uh, two thirds, right? Two thirds of that is going to go to my. Um, common shareholder. Okay? Okay, guys, so we're going to pretty much uh, wrap this up right here. Are there any questions? Because I'm not much of a fan of talking to myself. I already know how to do this stuff, so since there just seems to be an interest in something else other than the material, why don't we just... Life's too short, right, for us to sit here and torture ourselves? So any question on any of this? Or we want to keep going. It's up to you. I see no reason to sit here and torture ourselves. I know how to do it already. I already talked to myself through all of this this morning. I don't need to talk myself through it again. Okay, so we're done. So um, take a look at the quiz for this chapter. Okay, and then, or you want to keep going through it? I don't know. I'm not getting a feel. You want to finish this or not? Yes? Okay. All right, I'm just saying. I don't see any reason for us to sit here and kill ourselves if we're thinking we should be doing something else. So, Okay, so let's keep going. Then. Okay, now, we can also have property dividend. Okay, now with the property dividend, it's non-cash dividend. And as we've already said, we will use whatever we consider what? the fair value of, uh, we hadn't said this before, but when we're talking about dividend, the fair value of whatever it is to be distributed. Uh, I've heard discussion before that back in World War II, when there wasn't a lot of cash that was available and it was kind of hard to get, you know, your hands on alcohol, on whiskey, you know, some of the whiskey companies thought it was, you know, a good idea to go ahead and distribute bottles of whiskey as, you know, as a dividend, whatever. Okay, so it doesn't have to be you know, uh, cash. It can be some other type of property, and we use whatever the fair value of that property is. Now, when we're going to distribute property as a dividend, we first have to bring the property up to its fair value, whatever that is, okay? So, if we had a book value of nine, and the um, investment had a fair value of 10 million, we would first write it up. 
So I guess we're going to go ahead and issue some stock of a company that we hold the stock in. We're going to distribute that to our shareholders. So we first write it up, take that gain. Okay, then we go ahead and we set up our dividend payable. But now instead of being cash, it's a what? Property dividend payable. And then we go ahead and we simply distribute the what? The dividend date of record, no entry, but at payment date, we debit the um, property dividend payable and we credit whatever the asset is that we're giving them. If it was land, although it'd be kind of hard to distribute land as a dividend, but if it was land, we would credit what? Land, whatever asset it is that we're giving up. Okay. Stock dividends, what happens here? Now, instead of issuing property as a dividend, we're going to issue stock in our own company. So I guess Apple was doing pretty good on the market yesterday. Okay, so what would happen? Would you be happy if um, Apple had distributed a stock dividend to you? You bought one share and they go ahead and distribute a half a share to you as a dividend? That's pretty good, isn't it? Okay, so uh, sometimes company um, stockholders are happy to get a stock dividend. It's just additional shares of stock. Okay, now we come over and when we look at dividends, we have to look at stock dividends. We have to look at them to see if they are a small stock dividend or a large stock dividend. And the book sort of hints at this, but doesn't get real uh, detailed about it. So I went ahead and lifted some material from uh, another uh, source that I have access to here. And so let's take a look at first the small dividend. And it is a small dividend if it is less than 20 to 25 percent of the overall outstanding stock of the company. They consider that a small. Now, of course, I'll always get the answer. I'll always get the question, well, what if it's 22.5? How should I treat it? Well, we don't deal with the in-between, okay? When you look at question, whatever, it's going to be a 10%, right? 10% is clearly what? Below this 20 to 25% threshold, so we'll treat that as a small dividend. It's going to be 15%. Clearly, again, what? Below the 20%. I don't have you in between, okay? And I don't have you at 19.9999, okay? So I'm going to make it clear that it's either a small or a large, okay? Now, if it's a small dividend, then we're going to pay attention to what the market price is of the stock because that's what we're going to debit retain earnings for because we're saying, hey, we're distributing something of value to you. It's sort of like uh, the property where we would consider the uh, property being distributed. So we would debit retain earnings for what? for the fair value of the stock, whatever it is. And in this example, it was 5,000 shares, that at a $15 fair value. We credit the common stock at par, and then what? Then we credit the additional paid in capital for the additional amount. So it's sort of like what? Issuing the stock for cash, isn't it? But instead of debiting cash, we do what? We credit our own retained earnings. I mean, we debit our own retained earnings because we're distributing a dividend here, okay? Now, if it is a large stock dividend, then we consider that a return of capital. Now, what is large? More than the 25%. And no, it's not going to be, you know, 24.9 for you to see if it's 25. It's not going to be 25. It'll be, what, 30%, whatever, okay, of the outstanding shares get distributed in a stock dividend. And so what happens? Now we are simply going to credit the common stock at par and debit the retained earnings for the par. Notice what? The market value does not enter into this calculation at all. You would simply do what? Ignore the market value and record the entire transaction using the par value of the stock. So now we come over and it was a what? 40% uh, dividend, so it was clearly what? Large stock dividend times a million shares, that's 40,000 shares that are being distributed. The value of the shares are $10 par, not the market value, and we simply debit the retained earnings, credit the uh, common stock using the par value times the number of shares that were distributed. Large stock dividend. 
Okay. Okay, good. So with all that, and that's, uh, oh, one more thing. Stock splits. Sorry. Stock splits. Stock splits are basically when the company doubles the number of shares that each shareholder has and halves the price. Not halves, like having it. They have. They have the price, right? Okay. Now, um, when we do this, notice that what? The number of shares doubles, but the par value comes down by half. So if you look at the overall common stock account, it stays exactly the same, doesn't it? If an account stays exactly the same, do you have to make a journal entry to it? If an account balance doesn't change, do you have to make a journal entry to it? So there is no entry for a stock split. No entry. I mean, the answer to your questions are going to be no entry, right? I'll give you a whole bunch of information, and then D will be sitting down there, and the answer is what? No entry, right? Okay. Now, why would a company do this? Why would a company double the number of shares and have the price? Exactly. I mean, that's exactly the reason. It's a marketing because it's, it's more has more to do with psychology than it does accounting, doesn't it? And that what now people look and they say, oh, 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 five dollars, I can afford that. Ten was too much. A hundred's too much. Fifty dollars, okay, I got fifty bucks laying around here. I can buy the stock. It has more to do with psychology than it does business, doesn't it? It's a marketing move. Okay. Okay. So let's get out of this. Ah, shoot. And of course, you know what I forgot to do, right? Oh, no, I recorded. I was recording. Okay. Okay, good. So let's go ahead and let's close that. And I'm assuming you'd like to go through this um, practice quiz, whatever, this quiz. Hello? Okay. Okay, so let's look at the chapter 18 quiz. And um, in most cases, guys, I start the quizzes off, as you've seen, with some just sort of basic, uh, you know, when we do our practice midterms and stuff, I always start out with some basic stuff just to remind us of some of the general principles. The nature of your questions, as you well know by now, on your tests are typically a little more complicated than this, right? Okay, so this is just an idea of just some of the basics. Net assets of a corporation can also be called synonymous terms, what? Shareholders' equity. Net assets are assets minus liabilities, right? Okay. Okay, good. Come over. Two of the three primary account classifications within shareholders' equity. We have paid in capital. We have retained earnings. And what was the other one? Capital stock, whatever. Huh? Oh, that's true, too. We also have other comprehensive in um, accumulate other comprehensive income. That's a good point. And capital stock. So I don't know why they say the three primary. I don't know. How are we supposed to choose amongst our children, right? I mean, we have the stockholders' equity section, and we love the additional paid in capital just as much as we love the retained earnings, just as much as we love the capital stock, just as much as we love the other accumulated other comprehensive income, right? Can't ask an accountant to choose amongst their children. Okay? All right, so I don't know why they call it the three primary, but just a reminder of the things that constitute the stockholders' equity is the point of this question. Okay, okay, good. The corporate charter sometimes is known as articles of incorporation, right? Okay, and when we incorporate, we incorporate under laws of individual states, right? The correct choice is showing under the letter here. Don't ask me why. Okay. Okay, good. So just some basic things. 
issued stock refers to the number of shares what? Outstanding. Okay, let's make sure we're clear on this. Company is authorized in the Articles of Incorporation. And forgive me, guys, if I've already done this. Some of these things I've taught, I've discussed in another class, and then I forgot. I forget which class I've done them in. So if you know this, I've already done this. Say so you did this already. Authorized is a hundred thousand shares. Let's say, just making this up. Okay. Issued, say, is eighty thousand shares. And treasury stock. These are shares, not dollars. And treasury stock is say twenty thousand, uh, ten thousand. So we would take the treasury stock off of the issued, and the outstanding therefore is what seventy thousand. And a company would need to disclose the number of shares authorized, issued, and outstanding. So we would see this number. We would see what this number, we'd see this number, and the treasury stock, of course, would show as a dollar amount subtract from our stockholders' equity, like we were looking at that 13 or whatever, under the cost method. Okay. Okay, good. Coming down. Why do I keep seeing the word yoga up here? Is the word yoga anywhere on here? I don't know why I thought I kept seeing yoga. Remind me to go see the doctor tomorrow. <laughs> okay. Maybe they're telling me I should start doing some exercise. Do some yoga. Okay. All right. So what happened? Number six, Roberto Corporation was organized on January 1st, 2018. The firm was authorized to issue 100,000 shares of $5 par common stock. During 2018, Roberto had the following transactions. Issued 10,000 shares at $7 per share. That's what the market was at that point, right? A little bit later, the market's gone up for the stock a little bit, right? And so we issued another 20,000 shares at $8. We had net income of 100,000. We pay dividends of 50, so our net income is gonna go into retain earnings. Our dividend going to do what? Come out of retain earnings, and then we purchase 3,000 shares of treasury stock. Well, that's gonna be a subtract from my stockholder's equity, right? And so all we're trying to see here is we know how these different things will affect plus or minus the stockholder's equity. And so they're asking us for 2018, which means the beginning balance of stockholders' equity was zero. And then what? We issue the stock for the $7, for the $8. We add the net income. We subtract out the dividends. We subtract out the treasury stock, right? Okay. Uh, let's take a look at this one. And this one is... Uh, as of December 31st, 2018, and we say during 2019, half of the treasury shares were resold for 240, had net income of six, cash dividend declared was 1.5, stock dividend declared was 500,000. Now again, we've got to watch our dates. We say, what was the shareholder's equity at December 31st, 2018? And this problem is baiting you into thinking about what happened in 2019. Do we need to worry about 2019 to get the ending balance of 2018? Okay, so we just analyzed the 2018. And so we had what? We just got to pick out of here which one is is uh, stockholder's equity. Let's gonna affect stockholder's equity. How about dividend payable? Dividend payable is not part of my stockholder's equity, is it? It's a liability, isn't it? Okay, so I'm not going to include that. How about treasury stock? That's going to affect it. How about paid in capital? Part of my stockholder's equity. Other paid in capital accounts? St paid in capital stockholder's equity. Retain earnings? Part of my stockholder's equity, isn't it? Okay, so you just pick out those items. Paid in capital, the share 
purchased. So that's going to be that 20,000, not this one, the other one. 20,000, we pick up the others, paid in capital, the retained earnings, and treasury stock we needed to know is a subtract, right? Okay. Now, when you look at the next question, now the next question says, okay, the 2019 sale of the treasury stock would do what? Okay. Now, let's just look, and the way they set this up is by journal entry, and I think journal entry is a good way for you to analyze this because, you know, it didn't ask for the journal entry, because we know that we're going to do what? We're going to take out any amounts that are in excess of the amount in the treasury stock that's being reissued uh, out of the treasury stock account, and then we're going to have the cash that comes in. Any differences will first go to paid in capital for the shares, and then if there's still amounts that have to be made up for for the uh, difference between the treasury stock and the cash that we paid out. That's got to come out of retained earnings. Okay, so what happens? Not cash that we paid out originally. The cash that's coming in. So the way to set this up would be if they retired half of the treasury stock, and the treasury stock originally was this six hundred thousand. So half of that is what three hundred thousand. So they take that out of treasury stock, right? We know that we have, and I, this is how I would do this journal entry, guys, to help you an answer this question. So I'd go ahead and credit the treasury stock. I debit the cash for the, the, what's there. And I'm seeing now that I still need, what, $60,000 in this journal entry, okay, to make it balance. So I would then look to see what is in the additional paid in capital for share repurchase because I'm going to pull whatever I can out of that, right? And there's only 20000 sitting there. So I go ahead and I debit that for 20000 That's now cleaned out. And I have to make this journal entry balance. And so we consider that when you reacquire the treasury shares um, for, um, for an amount more than what you had, um, when you reissue them for more than what you had originally set them up for, that difference does what? comes out of the retained earnings. So retained earnings is the last part. That's the plug. Okay. Okay, good. Come over. And we have accumulated other comprehensive income. There's our other stepchild that we forget about all the time, what accumulated other, not that anyone forgets about a stepchild, but you know what I mean. The uh, fourth child goes to what? Goes to our, um, part of our stockholders equity. Okay. Authorized is what? All the shares that can be issued. That was that 100,000 shares in our little example, right? Okay, good. Let's take a look at this one. Uh, Green Corporation includes $200,000 of $1 par common stock, $400,000 of par 6% uh, cumulus stock. The board of directors of Green declared a dividend of $50,000 in 2018 after paying $20,000 cash dividends in each of 2017 and 2018. What is the amount that the common shareholders will receive? In other words, they're going to get what's ever left over after we catch everybody up, right? Okay. So when you look at this um, question, I think this table is the best way to look at it. We pay the what? Preferred the whole 20000 Now, they were supposed to get what? Twenty-four. Based on the, um, I don't know, it doesn't have to be a T account because it's not debit and credits. I'm going to do the arrears account up here. So they were supposed to get 24000 We only gave them what? Per the fact problem of 20000 Okay. And so that means we still owe them four, don't we? With me so far? That next year we give them what? We give them another 20, but we were supposed to give them what? 
24, right? So we got another 4,000 in arrears, right? Okay. And then that next year, they said they gave them how much? 50,000? Okay, good. So we've got what? 50,000. We got to give them the arrears of what? Well, we got to give them the 24. Always got to pay them off for the current year. And now we can give them the arrears of what? 8,000. So that means, what's that, 32,000? So 32,000 minus 50, what's that, 12,000? No, 18,000. I know that by looking at the answer because the rest is left to go to the common shareholders, right? Question? Okay. Okay, good. Um, okay, I was just checking to see that it did say cumulative. Okay, good. Come over and uh, that one was so fun. Let's do another one. This weekend, your friends want to hang out with you. You can say, hey, but before we do that, before we go ice skating, before we go uh, roller skating, let's do some of these questions. Everybody will be, oh, great. Okay. All right. So what's happening here? We've got the shareholders equity. Now Red Corporation includes $200,000, $1 par common stock, 400000 6% cumulative preferred stock. The board of directors declared a cash dividend of 50000 Is this the same question? Same question? Except a little different amount, is that what it is? Okay, so we have to do what? We have to pay them, oh I see, the first year they, uh, the first period we did what? We paid what was it? 40,000? Okay, so since we had to pay 24, there was what? 16 left over that could go to the common shareholders, right? Nothing in arrears. Then we had the 20,000, and if we do our arrears account up here again, that means there's 4,000 sitting there, okay? And so that next year, 24 plus what? Plus the four is 28, and I guess it was what, 60,000? What was it that last in 27, 2018, 50,000? Someday I'll learn how to add. 50,000 means that what? There was twenty-two thousand left to go to the uh, preferred share uh, to the common shareholders. Excuse me. Okay. Number thirteen. Rick Company had thirty million shares of one dollar par common stock, outstanding at January first, twenty eighteen. By the way, guys. Be careful, dividends are paid on the shares, what? Outstanding. We do not pay dividends on what? The authorized shares, so be careful. You know that I put the little wrinkle in your exam sometimes where all of a sudden I'll start telling you in a problem, shares authorized are this, shares outstanding are that, and you start going, what is this? What should I use? You use what? You use the outstanding shares, meaning you do not pay dividends on treasury stock, right? Okay, so I could tell you they have authorized and issued 100,000 shares. There's 20,000 shares of treasury stock, so that means that we're going to pay dividends on the, what, outstanding shares of 80, right? Okay, so we come over and we have this problem just gave me the outstanding and they say that they declare a dividend when the market price of the stock was $60 per share. In this problem, do we care about the market price of the stock? Is the market price of this stock relevant? Do we care about the market price? Yeah. We do because what? It's a small dividend, right? And you see how clear we make that we want you to know this is a small dividend. We're way down there at 1%. Okay. Okay, good. So what happened? They say debit the retained earnings for $18 million, And it's very simple. It's the 30 million shares times the 
1% means we're issuing 300,000 shares and we're going to go ahead and do what? Um, debit the retained earnings for the full 18 million using the market share, market value, right? Okay, so our retained earnings gets debited for what, 18 million? Our common stock, did they give us the par on this stupid thing? Yeah, common stock gets credited for what, uh, 300,000? And the APIC will balance that? What's that come to? 17,700,000? Right? Okay. Olson Corporation received a check from an underwriter. I think the main reason I put this question on here is to describe what's an underwriter. Can you go on the street corner and say, Psst, Hey, buddy, want to buy some of my stock? I got some right here. Take a look. Right? You have to go through the appropriate process, don't you? Okay? And so what happens? We're going to go through an underwriter. The underwriter essentially issues the stock for us and then hands us back the money for whatever they issued it for, right? So we're obviously going to debit cash for $72 million. We're going to credit the common stock what? At par, so it was five dollar par for a million shares, so that's a credit of five million, and then the difference goes to what additional paid in capital. And this question is so simple, the feedback is the answer. I mean, I'm like, thanks, I guess I picked something up from this, okay. Um, Koi Inc. initially issued 200,000 shares of one dollar part common stock for 1 million in 2016. In 2017, the company repurchased 20,000 shares for 200,000. In 2018, 10,000 of the repurchased shares were resold for 160. In its balance sheet, what should we show as treasury stock account, uh, treasury uh, stock account, show that, treasury stock account show as a balance, easy for me to say, and it's going to be what? I'm just going to do the journal entry on this. I don't like their explanation. As you know, their explanations are of no help sometimes. Okay, so what happens? When we issued the, when we purchased the treasury stock, we would have debited it, what? Treasury stock, 200000 and credited the cash. This is when we bought the treasury stock for 200000 And if they're reissuing what? They're reissuing now um, half of that, right? Then we're going to debit the treasury stock for 100000 right? For half the treasury stock. So we're going to credit the treasury stock for one hundred thousand. We'll debit the cash, and they told us that they did it for one hundred sixty. Is what they reacquired those for? So we acquired those treasury stock for what? For less than what we had originally paid for them, the half, right? And so what happens when that happens? Obviously, we need a credit of sixty thousand here. And that credit goes to a pick reacquired stock, whatever. The a pick for the reacquired treasury stock, right? Which well, that question didn't ask me that. It just wanted to know what should we do? What should be the account in the treasury stock account after that? Well, we just take it out of the treasury stock account, don't we? For the amount that we had originally put in. Okay, question? Okay, good. So, tomorrow, Friday, Doton will be here. He's going to talk to you about 
uh, disclosures around these issues, uh, dealing with stock. Okay, he's got some disclosures there that he can show you. And then um, I will put up the homework questions. Uh, I guess I better do it late tonight after I get back from my class in San Francisco. So after I do that, I'll choose some homework questions and put those in Connect so that if you do get a chance to look at those beforehand, you can ask Doton about those. Definitely on Monday, uh, I'm assuming we're going to ask Doton to come back on Monday and uh, he can uh, answer questions then about the things that are officially in uh, Connect at that point, uh, give you a little more time to look at them and he as well. That's on Monday. Uh, Tuesday, chapter 19. Same sort of thing like we did today, sort of take it all in one big chunk. Wednesday, chapter 20. I'm hoping maybe um, on Tuesday we can get into chapter 21 a little bit and then finish that on Wednesday so that we uh, hopefully will have time. I will definitely put a practice midterm and I want to try to go through as many of, much of that as we can on Wednesday and then you turn around and you get tested on that material on Thursday which is kind of a drag but um, I don't know we'll see maybe I'll do chapter 21 before I do chapter 19 and we'll just quickly go through chapter 19 because you gotta know 21 21 is something you really when I teach um, some of the higher level accounting classes uh, dealing with governmental accounting and some of the other areas. I find that a lot of the students don't know statement of cash flows and I think it's because a lot of intermediate to a classes run into the same problem. That we're rushing to the end and the teachers that says okay we're not going to do statement of cash flows and then I have to like teach everybody the statement of cash flows in a governmental accounting class. So rather than um, rather than put it on the next person, I'll try to make sure and cover it here so that we have the time to uh, get comfortable with that. Maybe we'll go more quickly through the earnings per share calculations. Okay. All right, guys. I will see you on Tuesday. Okay.